My name is Alan Gould. I'm the executive director of the Drinko Academy here at Marshall. And on behalf of the Academy and the Marshall community, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this, the 18th annual Distinguished John D. Bedrinko Fellowship Symposium. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you, Mr. Matt Turner, Marshall University's Chief of Staff, for a word of welcome. Matt. Good evening, everybody. Uh, what a great pleasure for, for me to be here. Um, I apologize, Dr. Kopp couldn't join us. He's actually en route back from Chicago. He and the provost have been uh, spending several days uh, with the Higher Learning Commission on a new accreditation program that we're working on for the entire university. It's a, a very exciting uh, uh, opportunity for Marshall, and, and he's glad to be a part of it. But uh, regrets we couldn't be here, but he did yesterday. He put a, a great deal of thought into a letter that he wanted me to read on his behalf while he's gone. But uh, I got to say, this is my second opportunity to enjoy this evening. Last year's was wonderful, so I'm really looking forward to the presentations this evening. But uh, if you would allow me to, to read this, a message from Dr. Kopp. I regret I cannot be with you this evening. Uh, Matt Turner, Chief of Staff, has graciously agreed to welcome you on my behalf and share some uh, thoughts about this evening's event. Uh, John Deaver Drinko and Elizabeth uh, Libby Drinko were dear friends and major benefactors of Marshall University before their passing. Anyone who knew John and Libby knew how much they valued the life of mind and the importance of higher learning to our society and nation. John was a self-made man who was gifted with an incredibly incisive intellect. His genius was complemented by a remarkable storytelling ability, a product of his humble rural upbringing in St. Mary's, West Virginia. When John commenced to sharing some of his ribald tales about his childhood, it was generally time for modest folks to close their ears. <laughs> my only regret is that John passed away far too soon for my liking. John was a true son of Marshall who credited his rise as one of our nation's preeminent and influential lawyers to the education he received right here at Marshall. He insisted on paying back his alma mater, which he did in part by creating the John D. Verdrinko Academy and the Distinguished John D. Verdrinko Fellows Award Program. The purpose of this latter award is to recognize the most distinguished from among Marshall's senior faculty. Over the years, the recipients have been the who's who of Marshall University faculty. As we all know, the first Drinko Fellow was named in 1994. Well, it was awarded quite fittingly to one of the folks who have joined us tonight, Dr. Simon Perry. Each succeeding fellow over the last, is it, I believe, 18 years? Uh, the tradition has continued. So this year we celebrate the accomplishments of the 19th Drinko Fellow, Professor Bernice Morris, who is concluding his Drinko Fellow year while also recognizing a milestone in the Drinko Academy with the selection of the 20th Drinko Fellow. To Professor Morris, congratulations and I look forward to catching up with you about the work completed during your time as a Drinko Fellow. And to our newest distinguished John Deaver Drinko Fellow, Dr. Robin O'Keefe, where is Robin? Uh, Dr. O'Keefe, I offer my heartfelt congratulations. And to all of you, best wishes for a memorable evening. I am terribly sorry I couldn't join you. Thank you, Dr. Cobb, and thank you all. Thank you, Matt. Um, I want to um, also publicly thank Dr. Kopp for his generous support of the various activities of the Drinko Academy. He's been one of our staunchest supporters. Um, over the years since assuming the presidency in July of uh, 2005, he has personally participated directly in a number of our programs and only on rare occasions missed one of our scheduled activities. And this is one activity recognizing our Drinko fellows that he always like to attend. So I too want to publicly uh, acknowledge his support. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening's celebration of and tribute to our distinguished Drinko Fellows. By way of background, I'm a historian, so I have to speak historically. Historically speaking, on April the 7th, 1994, the John D. Verdrinko Academy was officially established here on the Marshall campus. And as I've often stated, the Academy and all of its accomplishments over the past 18 years owe its success 
to two generous, loyal Marshall supporters, the late doctors John and Elizabeth Drinko. As in the President's letter, uh, John has expressed on numerous occasions, was especially impressed with the outstanding quality of the faculty. He is a poor boy from St. Mary's, West Virginia, had while attending Marshall College. He insisted that someday, again, as President Kopp said, he would pay the school back for the quality of the instruction that he received. He once said that someone built the place before I got there, so I always wanted to pay that back. Without that education, John once remarked, I'd still be shooting squirrels back in West Virginia. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So it was at John Drinko's insistence that the Academy from the outset acknowledge preeminent members of our faculty. Thus was created this award, and tonight we honor its holders, the distinguished John Deaver Drinko Fellows. Uh, this all began 18 years ago and the Drinkos never missed this annual appointment ceremony and symposium until John's untimely death in 2008. So tonight, in keeping with John's expressed desire, we celebrate and salute its holders, the distinguished John Deaver Drinko Fellows. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our fellows who are in the audience this evening. <clears throat> but first, I might say that perhaps as you can tell from the sound of my voice, I'm recovering from a week-long cold, and so I have reluctantly been forced to alter my usual introduction, my Drinko Fellows. Uh, owing to my indisposition, I will limit my remarks by simply acknowledging the Drinko Fellows in attendance tonight. I do want all of our fellows to know I labored intensely over lavish instruction um, introductions, <laughs> but there's at least one person in the room that is happy with the cold I got and the decision I made, and he's sitting right over here, our chief counsel, Leighton Cottrell. <laughs> before, before doing so, though, I want to state that our, our fellows represent the very foundation and the fabric of this institution. And although I'm unable to describe their con contributions in more detail, I can attest that to the fact that their work reflects the very best of our faculty in teaching, research, and service to the Marshall community. With that brief introduction, now I shall introduce our fellows. Now tradition dictates, I begin introductions with Dr. Simon Perry, our first Drinko Fellow back in 1994. Simon, are you awake? I'll just say that Simon, as we all know, was uh, for a long time chair of the Department of uh, Political Science, and he's a professor emeritus, and he joined the faculty back in 1962, 1962, and he retired from service, uh, active service, in 2010, making his 48-year tenure as a faculty member the longest in the history of this institution. Now, I wasn't going to do this because these are short introductions, and I do it every year, so tradition dictates that I do it. Uh, I might also mention, as I've said every time I've done this, that um, Livy Drinko told me to stop doing it. <laughs> told me I was being nasty to Simon. But I must say that <clears throat> we purposely selected Simon as our first Drinko fellow because we did not want the benchmark to be established too high. So there, I've done it. <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> Mary Nell's saying no and boo over here. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mac Gillenwater. Mac was our second fellow, 1995-96. Dr. Gillenwater is an emeritus professor in geography. He joined the faculty of Marsh University in 1968. Among his many contributions, and they are legion, I recall his direction of a massive his historic preservation study that led to the successful establishment of the Huntington Downtown Historic District. That was a monumental task that he carried out, and the fruits of it are being enjoyed today. And that's just one of the many things he did. Mac, where are you? Would you stand up? Thank you.
Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. William Denman, Rinko Chair, 1966-1996-1997. If it was 66, it'd be Simon at the beginning. Bill is a professor emeritus in the Department of Communication Studies. He joined the Marshall faculty in 1965, and his 38 years of service before his retirement in uh, 2003 included his appointment as the director of the uh, Society of Jaeger Scholars, and I believe he was the first director. He also served as chair of the Department of Communication Studies and as interim uh, director of, of the Integrated Science and Technology Program in the College of Science. Bill, would you stand to be recognized? <laughs> Glad you're here. Now another favorite of mine, fellow historian, Dr. Montserrat Miller, Rinko Fellow 1996. Dr. Miller is professor of history in our College of Liberal Arts and is a highly regarded teacher and scholar. She is truly one of our best and one of our brightest. And among many awards that she can claim, Montserrat was named in 2007 the Faculty Merit Foundation's West Virginia Professor of the Year. This was a great honor both for her and for our university. Montserrat, please stand and be recognized. <clears throat> Another dear colleague and friend, Dr. Shirley Lumpkin, Drinko Fellow, 1997. Shirley joined the Marshall faculty in 1983, presently holds the rank of professor in the Department of English. Among numerous activities, Dr. Lumpkin is a leader in the university's writing across the curriculum program in the Marshall University Writing Project, and according to my son, who was one of her students, in the graduate course, I believe, maybe it was undergraduate, said she is the litmus test for great teachers at Marshall University. Shirley, stand up. <clears throat> now it's my pleasure to introduce a dear colleague and friend, Dr. Kenneth Ambrose, Drinko Fellow, 1998-99. Dr. Ambrose is Emeritus Professor of Sociology. He joined the Marshall faculty in 1975 and retired in 2010. He served as chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology from 1983 until his retirement. He also served as dean, interim dean of the Marshall Graduate School in 1984. As I said, he is a true colleague and friend and an outstanding faculty member. Ken, please rise. My pleasure now to introduce Dr. Edwin Bingham, Branco Fellow, 2003-2004. Ed is Professor of Saxophone <coughs> and Director of the Jazz Studies Program here at Marshall, where he directs the University Jazz Ensemble and coordinates two major annual festivals held on campus each year. He is also a founding member of Marshall's uh, faculty jazz ensemble, Blue Train. I'll simply say that he is an inspiration to his students and a truly accomplished professional. Ed, will you stand to be recognized? <laughs> Did I do it the way you told me to? <laughs> now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary E. Mary Elizabeth, Mary E. Reynolds, Draco Fellow, 2004-2005. Dr. Reynolds joined the Marshall faculty in 1996, holds the rank of professor in the Department of Communication Disorders, and currently serves the university as director of academic assessment. She also chairs the West Virginia Higher Education Assessment Council. She is a highly respected and most sought after scholar in her field of study. And it's my delight to introduce to you Dr. Mary Reynolds. Beth, Mary Beth, you stand to be recognized. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Charles Somerville, Drinko Fellow, 2005-2006. Dr. 
Dr. Somerville came to Marshall in 1997, and in 2006, he became professor and head of the Division of Biological Sciences, and currently holds the position of dean of the College of Science. He is a renowned microbiologist and was recently appointed by the governor to the West Virginia Environmental Quality Control Board. Uh, and as I said, recently he became a dean, and I told him he's gone over to the dark side, <laughs> and his faculty will never trust him again. Chuck, will you stand and be recognized? <laughs> now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce another delightful of our Drinko Fellows, Dr. Linda Spaddock. Drinko Fellow, 2006-2007. Dr. Spaddock joined the Marshall faculty in 1987 and presently is a professor of education in the College of Education and Human Services, holding a joint appointment in the Doctoral Leadership Studies Program. Recently, Linda and her daughter, Lane uh, Spaddock, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Mary Connor, completed a book that they wrote together based partly on her research, which is now being under review by the Ohio University Press. Linda, will you stand to be recognized? <laughs> now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wendell Dobbs, Drinko Fellow, 2007-2008. Dr. Dobbs joined the faculty of the Department of Music in 1985. Presently, he is professor of flute in the Department of Music and directs the university flute program. During his Drinko Fellow year, he, along with his equally accomplished wife, Professor Linda Dobbs, who's also with us this evening, founded the John Marshall Fife and Drum Corps that we all really enjoy. Um, he is an accomplished and versatile musician, and he does perform with the Fife and Drum Corps, marching in line. He's not the chief, he's in line. So I like to refer to him as Private Dobbs. <laughs> Would Private Dobbs please stand and be recognized? <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Carmen Riddle, Drinko Fellow, 2008-2009. Dr. Riddle joined the Marshall faculty in the fall of 1983 and retired in the spring of 2011. She's an emeritus professor of Spanish and former chair of the Department of Modern Languages. She's also served as supervisor of the Departmental Study Abroad Program, both in France and Spain, and as a faculty advisor and director of the Summer Language and Cultural Program held in Madrid. She is also an outstanding and accomplished scholar, and we're pleased to have her as a Drinko Fellow. Marie, would you stand? <laughs> and next and last, but certainly not least, I guess you might say, Dr. Dan Evans, Drinko Fellow 2010-2011. Dr. Evans joined the Marshall faculty in 1974. Presently holds the rank of Professor of Biological Sciences in the College of Science. And since 1974, Dan has served as curator of the Marsh University Herbarium. Among numerous honors, Dr. Evans is a National Science Fellow, a member of the Society of Herbarium Curators, which was past president, the Herb Research Foundation, the South American Explorers Club, and the West Virginia Academy of Science. Dan, will you please stand and be recognized? Now, I want you to know I haven't forgotten Professor Bernice Morris, our star for the evening. He will be more fully introduced following dinner. But in summary, there, these are some of our outstanding Drinko Fellows, and collectively, all of our Fellows represent collectively a remarkable 530 years of service to Marsh University. Simon makes up about half of that. <laughs> the devil makes me do it, Simon. I'm sorry. It's been a great personal honor for me to be affiliated with these fellows. To quote the noted American scholar, Henry Adams, teachers affect eternity. They can never tell where their influence stops. And that's certainly true of our Drinko fellows. And in closing, I'll quote Dr. Kopp's opening remarks. Over the years, the recipients have been the who's who 
by the Marshall University faculty. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask, join me, I'm gonna ask all of our Drinko faculty members to, our Drinko fellow members to stand and be collectively recognized with a round of applause. Would you all please stand up? Now I have one <coughs> last present du uh, pleasant duty to perform regarding the introduction of our Drinko Fellows. And that's to present to you for the first time publicly the Drinko Fellow for the academic year 2012-2013. He is an accomplished teacher and brilliant researcher and holds the rank of Associate Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. And I know we will continue to hear great things about him in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to give you the, the distinguished John D. Bedrinko Fellow for academic year 2012-2013, Dr. Robin O'Keefe. Well, this concludes uh, the introduction of our fellows. Uh, and following dinner, we will have the Drinko Symposium that I know we're all looking forward to. So please enjoy dinner. First, personally, I take special pride in the fact that we can claim Dr. Carter G. Woodson as one of our own, for he spent um, his formative years here in Huntington. And because not only is the most, he is the most accomplished scholar produced in Huntington, he is arguably the most outstanding scholar produced in the state of West Virginia. And secondly, and professionally, as a fellow historian by trade, I appreciate Dr. Woodson's monumental contributions to our craft. Not to steal any of Bernice's thunder, and as many here already know, Woodson was the second African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University, and I believe he's the first in, in history. Bernice can clear us up on that. Parenthetically, uh, the first to receive one was uh, W.B. Du Bois. But what made um, Carter G. Woodson especially unique was that his parents, unlike those of the boys, were born in slavery. And also, Woodson would go on to become known in the profession as the father of African American history. What remarkable accomplishments, and I think it's wonderful that we can claim him as one of our own. Now lastly, for both professional and, and personal reasons, and from that perspective, it was around, and I was talking to Nawath about this earlier, it was around, I think, 23, 24 years ago, when uh, then Mayor of Huntington, Bobby Nelson, appointed me to the newly created Carter G. Woodson Committee. I benefited from the membership in two significant ways. First, it reintroduced me to the body of Dr. Woodson's works, and secondly, it introduced me to some wonderful people my fellow Carter G. Woodson Foundation Board members. And I'm pleased to add <clears throat> that some of them are with us this evening, as well as other guests who possess an abiding interest in the life and times of Carter G. Woodson. So if I may, I'd like to take just a few minutes to introduce these fine folks to you. First, I'll begin with <clears throat> the introductions with members of the board of the Carter G. Woodson Foundation that are in attendance tonight. First and foremost, sitting in the back there, is Nawatha Myers, an old friend and colleague. Uh, Nawatha has close marsh connections. She worked in our library system as a librarian associate. She serves uh, ably as the president of the Carter G. Woodson Foundation, and I will take credit in nominating her and cajoling her and begging her to become president of that group. And I also want to put in a plug. The foundation will be holding its 20th annual fundraising banquet on the 21st of April here on the college campus. 
Their speaker will be none other than Bernice Morris. So I'm putting in a plug. If you have the time, I encourage you to come, buy a ticket. It's a fantastic evening. And I know you'll enjoy it. So Noatha, would you stand to be recognized? Where are you? There she is. <clears throat> We have um, <clears throat> some other board members with us, another dear friend and colleague from ages ago, won't say how long it's been. It's Joe, Joseph Boster, Bostar. Joe is a long-term member of the board of the Carter G. Woodson Foundation. I think he was there from the very beginning too. And for many years he served as uh, a very effective treasurer for the group and has been a mainstay in the work of the Woodson Foundation. So I'd like to ask Joe Buster to stand and be recognized. Joe, where are you? It's also my esteemed pleasure to introduce Karen Nance. If you know Karen, you know without doubt she is the leading historic preservationist in Cabell County. She's been involved in just about every major effort uh, we have to maintain um, our historic background and our buildings. She also serves as the um, secretary of the Carter G. Woodson Foundation Board. So I'd like to ask Karen to stand and be recognized. And we have one last member. His name is David Harris. David is an uh, old dear colleague and friend of mine. Actually, we go a long way back because um, I had him as a history professor. He was one of my students. And believe it or not, he was truly an outstanding student. <laughs> I had to do that, David. Uh, he is also a member of the Marshall community. He's one of ours. He recently retired as the Marshall University Director of Equity Programs. And recently, uh, he told me, and I read in the paper, he was honored as a West Virginia history hero by the state's Division of Culture and History. As I said, he is a member of the Woodson Foundation Board, serves as its treasurer, and in many other capacities. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you my student, my friend, and my colleague, David Harris. We have other distinguished guests in the audience that I would like to, to mention. First, Ms. Emma Williams. Ms. Williams is a member of the board of the Cabell Huntington NAACP as well as many other civic uh, organizations, including the Board of Hospice of Huntington. Ms. Williams, would you stand to be recognized? <laughs> you can get up. <laughs> Glad you're here. Also, I see out there at the same table, Ms. Dorothy Scott. Ms. Scott is retired principal at Miller Elementary School. She's also a member of the board of the Cabell Huntington NAACP and many, many other civic activities, good works in the town. So Ms. Scott, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you for coming. Thank you. We also have in the audience Ms. Jacqueline Proctor, who's a Huntington resident. Ms. Proctor is the former deputy commissioner of the West Virginia Division of Culture and History. Most recently, she was the Director of Communications for Governor Earl Ray Tomlin, and presently she serves as Deputy Commissioner for the West, Vin West Virginia Division of Tourism. Ms. Proctor, would you stand to be recognized? Thank you for coming. <clears throat> we also have other distinguished guests in the audience that I want to introduce, and these people have a more, perhaps, direct relation with Marshall University. First and foremost, I'm thrilled to see a dear old friend, scholar, who's here with us tonight. I think she told me this evening, earlier on, that this is the first time she's visited the campus since her retirement. And it's a great honor to have her here. That's Dr. Betty Cleckley. When I was serving as Vice President of Academic Affairs, Betty became our first Vice President for Multicultural Affairs. Her leadership established the foundations and the high standards for our successful diversity programs at Marsh University. And it's an absolute delight to welcome her back to the campus. 
Dr. Cleckley, please stand and be recognized. We also have with us Dr. Sherry Clark, who serves as the successor of Dr. Cleckley. She is our present Vice President for Multicultural Affairs, and she is admirably building on the foundations laid by Betty. So I'd like to ask Dr. Sherry Clark to stand and be recognized. <laughs> Another dear friend and person I have great admiration for, also part of our Marshall community, that's Sandra Clements. Sandra and her Marshall connection, she serves as a counselor, very ably as a counselor in our Office of Student Development, and also as most here know, as an honorable and able member of the Huntington City Council. Sandra, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> and if you live in her district, please vote for her the next time around. <laughs> I will. <laughs> also, I see there with him uh, another dear friend, old colleague, Dr. Dolores Johnson. Dolores is an emeritus professor of English here. Uh, she was the university's first Carter G. Woodson Initiative faculty member. The program was started under Betty. It's a program designed to uh, encourage our minority faculty to complete their terminal degrees. Dolores was the first recipient, and by far, as far as I'm concerned, the most able. So where are you doing? Stand up and be recognized. We also have another important Marshall representative here tonight. I'm pleased she was able to be with us. That's Michelle Douglas. She is our effective and very able director of human uh, resource services. Where are you? Michelle? There she is. And last but not least, I'm very proud to say, we are honored to have in our audience some direct descendants of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. One is an uncle and the other is his nephew. <coughs> Excuse me, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the uncle first, Mr. James Hurst. He is the great grand nephew of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I might also add that he is a Marshall University graduate, class of 1987. And by the way, he did bring with him this beautiful collection of Carter G. Woodson stamps. I don't know whether you had the opportunity to see them, but they're in the foyer of this uh, theater. Oh, you put them back. Well, you missed it. <laughs> Maybe the next time you can see them. Also in attendance with him is a nephew who is also a proud descendant of, of Dr. Woodson, and this is Mr. Gerald Kelly. Would you plan to be recognized? <laughs> We're indeed honored to have you two gentlemen with us tonight. We really appreciate you coming. Now this concludes our introductions, and I want to thank all in our audience for being with us this evening as we recognized our distinguished Drinko fellows, and we will soon learn more about our own Dr. Carter G. Woodson. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the W. Page Pitt School of Journalism and Mass Communications, Dr. Corley Dennison, who will introduce our superstar for the evening. I was actually the first person at Marshall University to meet Bernice uh, when he arrived for his interview. He flew into the Charleston airport, and I remember early on in our conversation, he was uh, surprised to learn he was standing in the largest airport in West Virginia. <laughs> so we talked some more on, on the way down the road, and uh, Bernice came to us as our first visiting, uh, not our first bit, but as a visiting professor, 
uh, Woodson professor, and then we talked him into making it a permanent position, and we're glad that he did. Uh, Bernice has been with us since 2006. So it's a pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Bernice Morris. He's the 19th Drinko Academy Fellow, and he's been conducting an analysis of how historian and educator Carter G. Woodson used the press to sell African American history, and is deconstructing Woodson's book, Miseducation of the Negro, a strong indictment of American education and how it systematically ignored contributions from racial minorities. Bernus also received a West Virginia Humanities Council Fellowship for this project. Professor Morris is a native of Laurel, Mississippi, which also happens to be the hometown of Lena Horn, you know, stormy weather, <laughs> uh, and graduated from the University of Mississippi, where he was the first black student elected to who's who among students in American universities and colleges. He was the first black student admitted to the Old Miss chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. He graduated with his BA in 1973 and later received his master's in public administration from the University of Dayton. Burnus has reported for a number of major newspapers, beginning his career as an intern for the New York Times, then reporting and editing for the Atlanta Constitution, the Journal Herald of Dayton, Palm Beach Newspapers, the Charlotte Observer, and the Austin American Statesman. Professor Morris rejoined his alma mater as a faculty member and the first Samuel Talbert lecturer in 1988. He was also a visiting scholar at the Freedom Forum First Amendment Center at Vanderbilt University in 1994 and 1995. He is a former Gannett professional in residence at the University of Kansas and received a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship as a journalist studying modern fiction at the University of California, Berkeley. Since the year 2000, he has received more than $1 million in grant money, including over $800,000 from the Knight Foundation for his nationally recognized fourth estate and third sector that strives to improve news coverage of nonprofit institutions by helping journalists understand the tax-exempt sector. He's authored two books, Nonprofit News Coverage, A Guide for Journalists, and Covering Nonprofit Organizations and Their People, A Journalist's Guide. As I mentioned, Burnus arrived on the Marshall campus in 2006 as the Woodson Chair of Journalism, where he's founded the annual summer workshop for high school journalists. He serves as the head of the journalism division in the J School. He's a faculty senator and a member of the Faculty Senate Executive Committee. Once again, it is my pleasure to present my friend and colleague, Professor Burnus Morris. Just like to make uh, one correction, uh, Laurel is the home of Leontine Price, the opera singer. <laughs> um, Lena Horne was a jazz singer, and uh, Woodson probably wouldn't have liked her since he didn't like jazz. <laughs> um, another point about uh, Woodson's personality is uh, when he held uh, his association meetings, uh, he would never hold them on weekends when there was a college football game. But we're holding this meeting when there's a Final Four basketball. <laughs> he would be proud of you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Corley, uh, Dr. Gould, Drinko Academy members, and uh, Dr. Whitson's family. Um, over the years, I have accumulated, oh, I should have, I wanted to identify that picture. Can you go back one, on that slide? Um, has anyone heard of Pearl Buck? Yeah. Uh, the, that's her with the circle around her head. Uh, Woodson uh, is to her right. Uh, she attended uh, the Association for the Study of Negro uh, Life in History uh, in uh, Chicago in 1940. Uh, I didn't realize until I got involved in this project that she was such a force on civil rights. I knew her interest in China, but uh, not civil rights. Uh, her um, um, freedom of information file is on the FBI website. You don't have to request it. Uh, hers is so popular that you can just click on it. And every time she spoke in favor of women's rights or civil rights, uh, they put uh, an item in her file. <laughs> um, over the years, I have accumulated a long list of questions. People have asked me about Carter G. Woodson. Number one on the list, how did Woodson use the black press from 1915 to 1950 to sell 
African American history. Okay, I confess, no one has ever asked me that question. <laughs> um, rather, it is, is my research question. I, I wanted a fresh approach to the Woodson story, something more than a recasting of Miseducation of the Negro, uh, Woodson's most famous book in 1933, or how he rose from the coal mines and Huntington to become the father of black history. Those topics would be interesting, uh, but the black press angle, uh, I'm sorry, the black press angle evolved as I read more and more about Woodson uh, through his documents and uh, uh, newspapers, uh, articles he wrote and articles about him. Uh, Woodson's use of the press, as far as I can tell, has not been seriously examined. Other researchers have noted that he wrote for uh, various uh, African American newspapers, uh, but they have not uh, gone beyond a simple mention that he did those things. Um, they note that he wrote for Garvey's uh, The Negro World. Sometimes uh, you see that mentioned just uh, as an insult. He, uh, he didn't like that, that association of, uh, of, uh, of Garvey's. Uh, most of the credit for Woodson's appeal to the masses was assigned to his Negro History Bulletin, uh, a publication Woodson uh, started in 1937 for a general audience. However, until now, no one has argued that black newspapers play a major role in Woodson's campaign, uh, which he called the cause, uh, to correct the misperception that African Americans have no history worth preserving. Um, Kevin, can you play the audio file for me? I shook my head in disbelief. But in the days that followed, I read another of the books and another, and they were all grinding out that weird story. The American Negroes are the only people in the history of the world that became free without any effort of their own. The Negroes were content in slavery and would have remained if it hadn't been for Northern interference. Negroes were not cruelly treated, and it was a travesty upon nature to give them equality with the white people of the South. Book after book spoke out to condone the slave system and to berate its victims. Over and over in the cold pits, I asked myself, was this history? Why was the truth as I had known it and as my father had known it twisted and changed? One evening, when I left the mines and was walking home, someone tried to answer me. Mr. Woodson? It was the principal. I had avoided her class for weeks. Mr. Woodson? Ma'am, I'm sorry I missed class, but well, since I finished the course, I you thought I... You didn't finish. You quit. Well, I, I... I've gone through those history books. I understand why you left. Well, I never could understand those books. Why do they lie? Because... In this state, they don't dare print the truth about the Negroes' role in American history. If they did, in one generation, school children would grow up hating segregation and race discrimination, and those who profit by prejudice would have the ground shaken under them like an earthquake. I see. Then when will you stop teaching your children from books that distort the truth? Uh, when someone writes better books. <laughs> This is a dramatization of Whitson's life that was broadcast on radio in 1950, uh, two months before Whitson died. But um, it, uh, it's just amazing that he was so big and so few people know who he is today. Um, but back to my list. Uh, I'm calling it Things People Are Knocking Down My Door for Answers about Carter G. Whitson. Um, was Woodson as wealthy as most historians? Like Newt Gingrich. <laughs> Did Woodson make $1.6 million for his consulting work as a historian for the WPA? Uh, are there other questions I should ask, add to my list? Um, to be fair, my claim that people have been knocking down my door is slightly exaggerated, and my wording is not the exact wording. However, the significance of my list is that it is presented in Woodson's column writing style. He was a great storyteller. His columns were filled with anecdotes, uh, claiming some unidentified person 
engaged him in conversation about complex issues. Sort of like Jimmy Carter saying he uh, talked about nuclear uh, war with his daughter Amy. Uh, but unlike Fox reporters claiming some people said something when they had no sources, uh, Woodson was a teacher. He would make provocative statements like when he was writing from Paris that jazz music has been detrimental and should be stamped out as an evil. Or like his claims that blacks got their emotional style of religion from whites when he told the story of visiting friends in Huntington and having to call the police because the white Church of God members across the street were carrying on loudly. <laughs> or like in his dispute with religious leaders to merge black churches, he responded to someone who said Woodson was not a theologian. He agreed, saying he was not a public pest. <laughs> <laughs> or like the memorial service he attended in his home county of Buckingham in Virginia, in honor of a polygamous white Baptist minister, and Woodson remembered singing, Shall We Meet Beyond the River, wondering whether the deceased minister would be meeting, quote, his white wife or colored paramour on the other side. <laughs> Readers didn't always know whether these stories were apocryphal, unless he used names, as he did for the pastor in his hometown. His purpose, of course, was to get readers in a tone professors reserved for students to follow his analyses after he uh, grabbed their attention. He tackled high unemployment, racism, black fears about extermination, disrespect of women, emotional and economic strains of segregation, and he managed to squeeze in not so subtle history lessons about these topics. Tonight, he might compare young men wearing hoodies and the history of lynching. Woodson might say anything to draw attention to his message. He was fond of writing that uneducated black people were better educated than those with degrees, as he did in articles leading up to Miseducation of the Negro. Just to illustrate the point that the I'm sorry, that just to illustrate the point that the education system was flawed. Professor Adelaide Cromwell, a sociologist who knew Woodson, had this to say in 2007 about his stature. I believe that after the death of Frederick Douglass and before the coming on the scene of Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm, there were four blacks who had what you might call national recognition. And they were, you could name them, Dr. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, and Carter Woodson. Now, they were not all alike, they were very different people, as you know. Now, Woodson, I can't see what I've written very well. I was trying to decide how Woodson differed from those people. Uh, Rayford Logan, in his essay on Woodson, said that Woodson wrote and edited more books in the field of Negro history than any other scholar. He was one of the first African Americans born after the Civil War and living into the first quarter and beyond the 20th century whose life work affected the larger black community. So that's his assessment. Also, I think the interesting thing about Woodson, he got along with the other three. <laughs> they didn't get along with each other. <laughs> but it's very unusual, he did. I, uh, you know, he wrote for Garvey's paper. He and Du Bois were friendly. Uh, he just was able to get along with them in a way that you wouldn't uh, uh, think about. Now, of course, I was wondering, how did he accomplish all of these things? First of all, as you know, he lived frugally in yeah, the third floor of a small townhouse, row house in Washington on 9th Street, and he never married. Now, Washington had three wives. <laughs> Garvey had two, and Du Bois had two. So much for matrimony. <laughs> But, as I said, he was able to get along with, I, with all the others. Now, I was trying to decide, he was, I should say also, again, speaking as a pseudo-scholar, that I was uh, trying to think of what I should read on him. And I hope some of you have read this little book that uh, uh, Jacqueline Grogan did on Dr. Woodson, thin book 
called Carter G. Woodson, A Life in Black History. Small, I went to the library, there it was all by itself, hadn't been taken out for months. And I could keep it out until next November, <laughs> that they told me. But if I hadn't had that book, I, I would have been lost to say anything I thought meaningful. See, I couldn't say, as Dr. Frank said, he was, I was there in 1936. I want to honor him. She's trying to claim that she's younger than John Hope Franklin. <laughs> he, he was the other speaker in this tribute to Woodson in 2007. <laughs> she pretended to, uh, to forget his name at one point. <laughs> Uh, Woodson was, a, was as skilled in public relations as the other giants uh, Professor Cromwell mentioned. He used the black press to achieve his goals, and that is an untold story among his many achievements. Using newspapers, the dominant medium of his day, was no accident. Woodson was aware he could not sell his program to ordinary folks if he restricted his campaign to the scholars who read the Journal of Negro History. He didn't begin publishing the History Bulletin until more than 20 years after founding the Historical Association. He needed the mass media and he was comfortable playing on their turf. His uncles read newspapers to him when he was a boy and he read newspapers to his father who could not read. Woodson also read newspapers to illiterate West Virginia coal miners and understood how to inform and educate using the media. He even helped conduct a summer high school workshop at Morgan College on the essentials of journalism. Woodson emerged as a black media figure after the death of Booker T. Washington in 1915 when Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. His first issue of the Journal of Negro History grabbed the attention of the editorial pages of the Baltimore Afro-American in 1916. An editorial question assertions that the well-being of a race was endangered by misinformation. The Afro hit especially hard at a piece by A.O. Stafford, which argued that truth eventually would prevail, a position the editorial claimed contradicted the rest of the message in the journal. Uh, the, the newspaper's retort, if there is any truth to what Woodson and his fellow writers were saying, that the truth would win out, the Negro people would not be in danger of losing the whole truth of their history. The Afro, known for his attention-grabbing headlines, seemed to delight in the gotcha moment on Woodson. By, nine, by 1918, however, the Afro's editorial pages had been won over. Speaking of Woodson, the newspaper observed, the best part about things that he writes from time to time is that the reader can be absolutely certain that the truth about the Negro's side will be told absolutely and nothing will be omitted for fear of hurting somebody's feelings. Black newspapers were becoming powerful allies in Woodson's campaign and they would prosper from Woodson's success. The fact that he was political but not partisan made it appear to uh, he was above politics as they published numerous articles and editorials about Woodson's efforts to raise money and shed light on the plight of African Americans. They had to be careful about criticizing America's wars or appearing unpatriotic, for example, but they were free to urge to argue in favor of black history when few white people thought they had any. Woodson's textbook on black history was serialized, serialized in newspapers in 1923 even before the first Negro History Week observance in 1926. His comments regarding newspapers usually demonstrated an understanding of their role and their business model. Woodson also was keenly aware of the history of the black press. Freedom Journal, the first African-American newspaper, was founded in 1827. Both 19th century and 20th century newspapers were advocates of freedoms and civil rights, and Woodson's campaign was a good fit, and he often reminded them of their role. Woodson publicly chided newspaper editors for maintaining incomplete files and for not depositing, quote, their issues in the Library of Congress where they may be preserved to document the history of the Negro. Garvey's newspaper, The Negro World, was one of those papers. 
The Negro world, however, heeded Woodson's advice about record keeping and asked his readers to send their personal copies to the New York Public Library because its editors didn't have copies to spare. Woodson demanded that newspaper editors uphold their journalistic principles and added managing news archives to their list of duties. Preservation of newspaper archives would demonstrate, would document black achievements and preserve them for future generations. He bitterly complained about newspapers that reported trivial matters, such as reports of Congressman Oscar DePriest having lunch with a woman at the House of Representatives Cafe. What if he did, Woodson asked. He also, he also complained about how newspapers treated history with instant analyses of recent events, and he derided their definition of news. Quote, while these newspapers were playing up the affair of the repast given by Congressman DePriest, they said nothing about the significant things which he was doing at the very time, unquote. Often after lashing out, he sucked up to them, not wanting to bite the hands that, th that fed him. Quote, in no place has the Negro made greater progress than that evidenced by the increasing power of the Negro press. In every large city, with a considerable Negro population, there is now a successful weekly newspaper publishing to the world the case of the Negro and directing the race in the way of economic, social, and religious progress. These organs of thought now number more than 300. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of Freedom's Journal in 1927, Woodson announced his next association meeting would celebrate the centennial of the newspaper industry for Negroes, as he skillfully combined the history of black newspapers with the history of African Americans. Quote, prominent editors and journalists will take part in the program along with hundreds of scholars and educators interested directly in the advancement of the study of the life and history of the race. All phases of the subject will be discussed at length by those who know. Earlier in 1927, the Negro Press Association adopted a policy on Negro history, and they flattered Woodson, too. Uh, the Negro Press pledges itself to encourage a complete development and interpretation of Negro history as typified by the work of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Major newspapers fell in line promoting Black History Week and adopting Woodson's campaign. The Afro even ran a promotion in 1939 called the Fact Finding Dime Contest on history, awarding a dime to readers who sent in the most interesting fact. Woodson rarely drew distinctions between his promotion and journalism. He was not a paid columnist. He did not use the term columnist, although researchers and journalists of his day labeled him a columnist. He called his articles releases, as in press releases, and the newspapers treated them like columns, sometimes running his picture with a logo. Some of the releases were no more than announcements about upcoming meetings, but several papers put a Woodson byline on them or used them as news items. Woodson also purchased advertising strategically placed that supported the books he published and promoted. The ads were never far from the columns he wrote. Uh, Woodson carefully managed his image and that of the association. His topics included economic independence, uplift, history, politics, the arts, and his feuds with co colleagues and enemies, such as a letter he wrote to the Washington Star about the Howard University president when he was dean. Uh, fused with church leaders, unscrupulous foundation executives and columnists, whom he called Uncle Toms when they disagreed with him. He sent salesmen around the country to sell his books. One of them, Lorenzo Green, was one of, the re one of his research assistants. Green called on editors in each stop, and like Woodson, Green wrote articles for black newspapers and made speeches. Woodson also addressed women's clubs, 
school groups and newspaper reporters and editors who hung on his every word. If members of the press were not present at his events, he or his staff would send them accounts of what transpired, and often they used them. John Hope Franklin, um, John Hope Franklin called Whitson the people's historian. He became that partly through newspaper publicity. As an active member of the NAACP, Woodson was familiar with Du Bois' public education campaign. It is not clear whether Woodson borrowed his strategy from the NAACP or whether the NAACP borrowed from Woodson. However, the Atlanta Daily World published a report in 1934 on the 25th anniversary of the founding of the NAACP, citing its use of the press in much the same way as Woodson was using it. In fact, the NAACP's Crisis Magazine published an article titled Miseducation of the Negro by Woodson and promoted it through advertising in newspapers two years before Woodson published his book. Can you show my slides? Or I'll get to these in, a, in just a second. Um, as members of the press cooperated with Woodson's campaign, they also made Woodson a celebrity. He was such a star that his birthday was publicized, and many in the press grieved when it appeared Woodson was in poor health. The Afro-American reminded readers that Woodson had said he had one more year to live in 1927 and ran a headline, year is out, he's still alive at 53. Woodson had to issue a letter declaring he was okay and not close to dying. In 1929, the newspaper published another headline that stated, 54 and still alive. It reminded readers again in 1932. Woodson projected an image of a man pursuing a dream at extreme personal sacrifice. He took a vow of poverty and married his work. Newspapers bought into the Woodson persona. He drove a truck, was a vegetarian, lived in a small home office, walking distance to Howard University in one direction and Union Station in another. For years, he returned most of his salary to the organization and seemed to have had virtually no personal life outside of his work. The story of Woodson's legend spread rapidly. Nearly, 260, I'm sorry, nearly 62 years after his death, there is considerable evidence that Woodson was the man they thought he was. He stated in one column that he spent little on himself, perhaps as little as $12 a week, after holding back a few dollars to send his widowed sister in Huntington, the balance to the association. At one executive council meeting, members debated whether to pay him at all because he always returned his pay to the treasury. I must add that he did find the best restaurants in Paris and surprised friends who thought he had no life outside work when he was on his research trips to Europe. The presidents of Howard, uh, I don't know if it's still going on, went on for a long time in the past. Well, Durkee, President Durkee asked uh, Carter Woodson if he would monitor the black faculty and coming into chapel. You know, this almost seems like it comes from Julius Caesar or something, you know, way, way back. But this was in a living memory of living people. And of course, he didn't do that, and he didn't get along with the people now. But nevertheless, I don't want to wander on these anecdotes, but I was trying to find out uh, what I could see about his life that would show uh, how he dealt with white racism. And I, and I said, and where his strength came from, we didn't discuss. He came from a poor family, a family of uh, sharecroppers, ex-slaves, no wife, I've already said that several times, uh, uh, but miners, people who work the mines, and he worked the mines. And you know, I think that was an important part of his upbringing, to be in dangerous situations with people of another race when you really had to depend on each other and respect each other and not fear each other either. And I think he brought that mindset to his work with uh, the association, with the world, and, and with white people in general. Coming, if he had come off hard, everybody talks about coming off this, I grew up in the projects. Or I came from the inner city. What did you learn? You know, ever, never. You learned how to run sometimes. 
shoot, and shoot other times. <laughs> if you didn't learn how to stand up and say no, or I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna do it, or it's wrong, I don't agree, I'm not gonna compromise, it's my way or the highway, as they say now. Uh, and I think that he brought that from West Virginia to Washington. It should, out of, should be back for more now, out of date. But I found very interesting, this is really my main example, uh, how he dealt with the encyclopedia of the Negro. Now, those of you who've read recent history, you, you think Skip, Skip Gates had that idea, don't you? <laughs> he would like you to think he did. Anyway, the idea for having an encyclopedia of the Negro did not start with Skip Gates. And, uh, I've told uh, Henry Louis Gates, you know, who came out with his encyclopedia maybe 15 years ago. Woodson had the idea first for the encyclopedia. And um, the people who believe in Woodson attack Gates every chance they get. Because <laughs> Woodson never delivered. He, he wanted the encyclopedia, and he claimed uh, to his last days that he was going to come out with it, but he never did. Um, Woodson was no saint, as many critics would have argued. Uh, one columnist wrote, Dr. Woodson was so disagreeable, it was amazing that anyone in Washington was still speaking to him. Uh, others complained that his goal was publicity, and when he advocated reforming education, the head of Negro welfare in North Carolina, complaining about miseducation of a Negro, wrote that Woodson was a historian, not an educator. Should I repeat that for our history friends? <laughs> um, still, Woodson had his saintly moments. After he was beaten and robbed of $5 at gunpoint in 1933, Woodson used strong language in his column uh, condemning the thugs, but his response also was apologetic and blamed the depressed economy. The first part of the statement is angry, quote, so many poor Negroes have little to do now except gamble, racketeer, and steal. They are hungry and they will kill and rob before they settle down to starvation, unquote. Then he sounded compassionate, uh, quote, to remedy, this situation, to remedy this situation with respect to the District of Columbia, where conditions are much better than they are elsewhere, I joined with certain citizens in petitioning employers of labor to provide in some way for the large number of unemployed Negroes. On the one hand, he was like Rick Santorum, and then on the other, he was like Mike Dukakis. <laughs> Despite his popularity during the first half of the 20th century, Woodson is largely unknown today. The man who developed road maps to uncovering many centuries of neglected African and African American history never wrote an autobiography, and apparently he did not leave behind enough material for journalists and historians to write his full biography. Translated, nobody's found any dirt on him. Um, I should add to that. Uh, Paris Hilton and Snooky have uh, autobiographies. <laughs> Why couldn't Woodson write his own? <laughs> the, the best books about Woodson are uh, a self-proclaimed intellectual biography and a, biblio, a bio bibliography. Can we show our flowers? There they are. Uh, Woodson probably thought he had left behind enough information. He could not have anticipated people wanting to celebrate his 136th birthday. As I witnessed uh, in December, uh, there were hundreds of people there to celebrate his birthday. At the time of his death on April 3rd, 1950, Wilson was one of the most respected and recognizable African Americans in the world. The study of black history was becoming more than a black event, and Woodson was an inspiration to other groups as well. For example, in 1949, uh, Morris Shapps, a member of the American Jewish Historical Society, told Woodson that his organization had decided to observe Jewish History Week in April, having been influenced by the success of Negro History Week. By the late 1940s, it was clear that Woodson was winning his campaign, and the black news media declared victory. By this time, Woodson was making fewer public appearances and pronouncements but he was basking in media adoration as they sensed the time that his time was short. The 1948 Black History Week was celebrated by the Afro in a full-page tribute to history makers 
and a full-page Woodson interview. The Afro pointed out that by 1948, it was no longer possible to crowd into one week all the accomplishments of colored Americans. It noted that more and more schools were offering the study of black history. Then it quoted Woodson. Says Dr. Woodson, the record of the Negro must be studied and learned as we would any other story. We have too long had the habit of studying books to discover the record of other people, while in the case of wanting to know something about colored people, we write someone a letter or call him by telephone. But when I saw that quote, I, I wonder if he was complaining about the third Mrs. Booker T. Washington. She uh, wrote him frequent, frequently in the early 20s, asking for him for information for uh, speeches she was about to give on, on some person and uh, wishing he was there to help her write the uh, speech. And I, I wondered if he was complaining about her. Um, if any of you are wondering whether there is still a need to study Whitson and black history, I have a video clip from uh, Morning Joe, uh, an interview with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the uh, former basketball star, promoting his latest book on black history. Now, Daniel Hale Williams, who developed the concept of open heart surgery, a, yes. a black, it's incredible stuff. Why don't we hear more about these things? Uh, I think it's uh, a bad habit. Uh, so many uh, children, and especially in minority communities, they're told that uh, their best chance is in either athletics or entertainment. And there's a whole huge world out there that they could explore if they got the right educational foundation and applied themselves. But uh, no one's encouraged them to do that. They don't think that's even possible for them. And uh, we have to affect that uh, dynamic uh, as best we can. So my book really is an, an, an effort on my part to show them what's possible. Uh, that has nothing to do with, uh, with, with sports or entertainment. How, how many of these people in this book did you know about before you put the book together? Uh, a couple of them. I did a history book back in 96, and uh, I did a whole chapter on uh, Louis Latimer, who we were talking about earlier, uh, discovered the uh, filament for the light bulb. He also did uh, um, Alexander Graham Bell's uh, patent application drawing for the telephone. So telecommunications and, and electricity he started the Westinghouse Corporation. He was involved in all of these things. And uh, in doing research about him, I found out about a lot of, a lot of other uh, black inventors. So it was the impetus for this. Why, sorry, Mike, go ahead. Why do you think, we were talking about Louis Latimer, why do you think it is that all these years later, he is clearly a genius, Louis Latimer, who worked with Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Alva Edison, help the Edison Company become what it is today around the, this country, and you never hear of Louis Latimer. Why? why? I don't know. I, it, it's, I it, think it's, it's a black. bad habit. Uh, gender and race are, go a long way in letting people forget about contributions that significant people uh, make uh, to American life and, and, and to world culture. And it, it's really a shame. There's a really great uh, biography on Edison that was written a couple of years ago, and uh, Latimer isn't even mentioned in there. <laughs> Your book has really made me think about something. I grew up in Jim Crow, Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. I went to segregated schools in the capital of right. the United States. What if we were to teach black history to white Americans, if somehow integrate black history into the curriculum of American schools. Black history is American exactly. history. Is exactly. Put American history denied or uh, neglected. And uh, we have to get to a place where we understand that they are one. And uh, it's just that the light has not been shown in this corner and uh, go from there. The, the last person ask, asking a question was Carl Bernstein from uh, Watergate fame. Yeah, um, your initial reaction probably is, you know, this is an example of of uh, Woodson's work. Well, Jabbar is presenting his new book as if he uncovered all these facts about black history, that he's the first to do this. Woodson wrote all these things 100 years ago, articles and books, and he's not cited once in the book. Uh, but he's acting, and I wish I knew who published the book. I would, uh, I would offer them a book, too. <laughs> I, I, I just think that if, if he had uh, read Woodson, uh, he should have cited him. 
But the fact that we know so many uh, little facts about black history, like uh, Jabbar has accumulated over the years, and like many of you, you know, uh, and you don't know where it came from, but if you scratch the surface, you'll discover that it probably came from Carter G. Woodson. Even if he doesn't get cited for it, it probably came from Woodson. In closing, I would like to emphasize the significance of Woodson's use of the press. Woodson and the black press were partners in his 35-year public education campaign, which he waged as a journalist, historian, and public relations manager. The fact that we celebrate Black History Month more than 60 years after his death is evidence of success. The month of February is celebrated as much by the media as by historians. I will leave you with two rare items from the Woodson collections. Um, Kevin, would you play the first one? This is Woodson speaking in 1938 at his association meeting, and uh, this was broadcast live from New, from New York. And uh, it's the only uh, copy I knew of where we, you can actually uh, hear Woodson's voice. Well, we're only going to play a minute of it. The for the study of Negro life and history is to collect the records of the Negro and to treat them scientifically in order that the race may not become a negligible factor in the thought of the world. The past of the Negro race has been so obscured and bediddled by propagandists that little is known of the creditable record of the race. Today, as a rule, we take notice only of the undesirable Negroes and ignore those who are struggling to climb upward. Thank you, Kevin. This was, um, it's very difficult to find anything on Woodson because th this was the period before uh, we had permanent uh, records uh, on, on film, uh, or many of them get lost, even the ones that, that survived, uh, that very difficult to, uh, to find. But Whistling was very much aware of the mass media, and he wanted uh, to have an influence, not just in newspapers, but in uh, film and radio. He didn't know anything about TV yet. Um, my next one, the one I want to close and get out of your way, uh, is a 36 second video. Uh, of Woodson. I have a very important and official duty to perform. First, I want to tell you, of course, Burns, that you passed your trial with flying colors. And you're now one of the clan. You're one of the group. We're proud to have you among us. Now, I have something to give you. These are a couple of um, items that uh, indicate that uh, you are now a member of the Honorable Group of Distinguished Drinko Fellows. The first is a medallion that I will give to you. And I would admonish you that uh, anytime you wear your academic regalia or uh, anytime you feel like it. <laughs> Simon wears his every night. <laughs> Let me put this around your neck. Also, I have a plaque for you that I again admonish you to place in a, a prominent uh, area of your office or your home so others can enjoy your accomplishment. Bernice, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. I almost forgot, but I have one last duty to perform, 
uh, on the back of your name tags, you find a dot that shows you where you were sitting, but also on the back at each table, there should be one with a star as well as a number. If you have the star, then you get to claim the centerpiece on the table, okay? I want to thank everybody who helped me put this all together, and thank you for coming, and good night. <laughs>